I'm going to turn this over to uh, Virginia Heyer and Tyson Wiester. They're from the Census Bureau. They're going to give us a Census Data 101 overview on accessing population surveys. Um, uh, Virginia is with the Public Relations Office. Tyson is a program analyst. Um, Virginia is going to kind of give an overview of what is available from Census, and then Tyson is going to kind of do a drill into um, a drilling. He'll drill into what's available, and then you know do some you know. Uh, do some searches on the website kind of based around different different markets. So with that, um, I want to turn it over to Virginia. Welcome, Virginia. Great. Thanks, Chris. Good morning, everyone. So I'll just dive right in. My name is Virginia Heyer. I am with the uh, Public Information Office. I'm just going to give you a, a brief overview of Census Bureau data uh, and then turn it over to Tyson for a live demo um, of how to access this information. Uh, so to start, uh, the Census Bureau, uh, we measure the nation's people, places, and economy, and then we provide information uh, back to the public and to reporters uh, to uh, write stories or to make policy decisions uh, based on the information that we provide. Uh, we just concluded the 2020 Census, uh, and that's something that happens every 10 years with the decennial census where we count everybody in the nation. Uh, but every year we also produce annual statistics um, through some of our uh, very popular and very um, uh, and some not so popular surveys. So uh, the American Community Survey is definitely one that you'll want to access. Um, and we also have a lot of economic programs that people don't know too much about, but hopefully you guys will get a quick taste of uh, everything going on at the Census Bureau. Uh, to start, I just want to make sure that you guys are aware that we do have a media relations branch at the Census Bureau. Um, we are the liaison between the Census Bureau and the media. Uh, and uh, not only can you just call us for a quick data request, we also provide trainings like this one uh, and can do that for different newsrooms. Uh, and we also provide um, access to our su subject matter experts uh, who we can connect you with for interviews. So uh, feel free to contact us. Um, we are open five days a week, um, normally starting around 8.30 to five o'clock Eastern time. Uh, we have a newsroom on census.gov. This is where you can find um, all of our statements. Uh, I highly encourage you to sign up for our email subscriptions. Uh, and I've linked that here. Uh, you can also just go to census.gov and find us there. Uh, we also have a plethora of press kits. Uh, I would recommend uh, if you're looking at anything regarding the 2020 census to look back at the 2020 tab. Uh, if you're looking at any of our operations, that's where all of our press kits are housed is in that 2020 section. Uh, also really want to point out our blogs. Uh, with the 2020 census, we are uh, starting a blog series about our post-processing and quality of the 2020 census. Uh, we've released two blogs so far, uh, one from Acting Director Jarman and another from uh, Michael Thiem, who is the Assistant Director in our decennial area. And he uh, wrote about some of the processing uh, problems and issues that we're facing right now with the 2020 census. So I would just go ahead and uh, take a look at that. Uh, when you're looking at some data stories, I think a really great place to start with us is the America Counts page. Um, this has stories in there that provides uh, real, world app real world application and context to the data that we produce. Uh, so if you're kind of looking for any sort of data story to start with, I would definitely look at America Counts for some inspiration. Uh, so the 2020 census, uh, we uh, wrapped this up in October in terms of data collection. And right now we are in the processing phase. Uh, I mentioned those blogs earlier. Please check back with us weekly as we have um, more and more blogs talking about where we are in processing uh, the data. Uh, right now, the apportionment results are scheduled uh, by April 30th of this year. Uh, you can take a look at what we've done in uh, the past for 2010 uh, to to get a taste of what sort of information is gonna be available for the 2020 census. Uh, and then for redistricting, right now that schedule is to be determined, but again, take a look back at the 2010 information uh, and uh, Tyson's gonna give you a walkthrough of how to access the 2010 data, which is gonna be uh, very similar to how you're gonna access the 2020 information. You can compare back to the 2010 census if you are making any comparisons. And again, I just highly recommend that you subscribe to our email list to receive any of the up-to-date information um, on where we are with processing and any sort of date announcements. 
Moving into some of our other surveys, we have the American Community Survey. This is where you're going to find that socioeconomic information that used to be in the 2020 um, or in the 2000 census long form. Uh, now we ask this information annually. Uh, you can access this information through an embargo that the Census Bureau provides to uh, members of the media. Uh, we have release dates in September and we also have release dates in December every single year. So just mark those uh, months for a lot of Census Bureau information coming at you. We also have the current population survey. Um, this is uh, one of the more well-known recognized surveys. This is where you get that uh, monthly unemployment information that the Bureau of Labor Statistics puts out. Uh, we also put out information regarding income and poverty and health insurance that happens in September. Uh, and then we also provide um, one of the more popular releases is this families and living arrangements where you can kind of see how household dynamics have changed uh, over the decades. And uh, this information normally comes out in November each year. We also have our population estimates. So between um, the, the censuses every decade, we release annual estimates. Uh, and these are those official counts to use when talking about any uh, county, state, uh, city or town information um, that you should be using in your stories. Uh, we also have housing unit totals um, that are available at the national and state level. Um, because uh, 2021 uh, calendar year, um, we released the 2020 estimates. Um, those are more used for research purposes right now since we do have the 2020 census results, which is a full count. Uh, so next year in 2022, that's when you wanna start using the population estimates um, for between the 2020 and 2030 census. Um, I've linked um, some of the key dates here. Uh, December 2021 is when you're going to get um, the 2021 uh, dates for the uh, national and state. And then we start rolling out at all of the sub-geographic levels in 2022. Uh, these are our new surveys. These are the pulse surveys. So we have the small business and the household pulse surveys. Both of these uh, started uh, due to the COVID pandemic. And uh, we started these to provide up-to-date information on how businesses and how households have been impacted. Uh, for example, we're looking at uh, how many small businesses are participating in federal programs, um, such as the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, and we are also, uh, from a household side, uh, most recently we've added questions in about um, how people, um, their intent to receive a vaccination, and also how they've uh, planned to spend their stimulus payments. Um, there's a lot more in there um, also for the Household Pulse Survey. But I definitely recommend uh, taking a look. We put these out on a bi-weekly basis, so they're very, um, very current and very relevant. We also have our economic programs. Uh, we release uh, monthly, quarterly, and yearly uh, economic indicators um, at a national level. We also have the annual business survey and our economic census, which is every five years um, in the years that end in two and seven. Uh, and this is kind of that baseline for all of the economic indicators that go forward um, between those five-year uh, increments. So I'm going to turn it over to Tyson now, who's going to walk through um, how to access the information and do a little deeper dive into the American Community Survey, uh, which has a lot more uh, socioeconomic programs and information that you guys might be interested in, especially from a state house reporter side, you're going to get that really local level granular information um, for really important topics that you guys um, are following. So I'll turn it over to Tyson. Great, thanks Virginia. Um, and thank you all for tuning in. I had a couple of changes I needed to make from a technical standpoint, so I lost my backdrop, but um, let me go ahead and share my screen and we'll go into some more detail there about the American Community Survey and then ultimately transition over to data.census.gov and how you can access information. So lots of great information from the American Community Survey. It touches on social, economic, and housing characteristics that you can see on the screen here. And then of course, it captures the demographic information. Um, the same information that we collect on the decennial census is also provided every year through the American Community Survey, age, sex, race, relationship to householder, 
and a few other items as well. We'll show you how you can access some of this on data.census.gov. Um, Tyson, um, yeah. your, 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 your sound level keeps coming, coming in and out. Can you maybe check and see if your microphone is in securely or? It's connected to the computer. Um, so I, I'll move a couple of things. How is it now? Is it still cutting it? Sounds in? good now. Yeah. Okay. Let me know if there's any other cutting in and out. Um, so moving on for the ACS, one thing that's important to keep in mind is that the availability of the ACS data tables does depend on the population that lives in the geographic area. So for geographies with 65,000 people or more, you can use the ACS one-year estimates, but for geographies smaller than that, you'll want to make sure to use the ACS five-year estimates. They provide data regardless of the population size in that geography. Um, it's one of the product drop-down menus in data.census.gov and something just to keep an eye on as you're looking for data on the site. And then the geographic availability of census data does depend on what the survey and program provides data for. So this is kind of a hierarchy showing you the most common types of geographic areas that you can access information for on data.census.gov. Some of the economic surveys and programs that we talked about briefly are laid out here in the red, and those are the geographies that are available for that particular data. Um, the American Community Survey, what really sets that apart besides that long list of topics you saw on the earlier slide is that it does go down all the way to the block group level. So very small granular geographies that you can access this information for. And then of course the decennial census goes one step further down to the census block level. Tyson, if I could ask just one definitions question, could you give us just a sense of census tracts, block groups, and blocks. I mean, what are, how, how, how big are those? That's a great question. Um, we're actually going to look at this visually on data.census.gov in a moment okay. as census tract. But um, essentially, they build into each other. So blocks, you can think of as city blocks, um, individual city blocks only data through the decennial census for that. When you combine many city blocks together um, based on population of several hundred to just a couple of thousand, um, those are the requirements for block groups. And then the block groups fit neatly within census tracts. So you usually have anywhere between one or for block groups somewhere around in there is typical um, in any one particular census tract. Um, so it's all kind of based on population size. We generally refer to census tracts and block groups as like the closest Census Bureau neighborhood geography. Okay, thanks. Yeah, great question. Um, so we're gonna look at some of this on the site uh, we're going to focus mainly on the American Community Survey as well as the redistricting data from the decennial census. We're going to pull this up for the 2010 census, but the steps to do this will be the same as you would if you were accessing it for the 2020 census. So what we show today will certainly be, be beneficial in that regard of preparing you to access that information. If you're interested in general, we do have ACS data on our site back to 2010 decennial census data for census 2000 and 2010. And then there are several economic census and some selected surveys. Those are available from 2012 through the present. If you want more details, uh, we have a link at the bottom of this slide that walks through specific uh, surveys and even products and types of tables that are available on the site. But with that, let's go ahead and transition over to the live demonstration. If you're just getting started with census data, um, the good thing about data.census.gov is we have really the um, comprehensive set of available information. If you're not sure where to start, we recommend using what we're going to uh, show you, the geography profile. I'm just going to pull that up for a particular county. 
So it's going to give you a good idea of the breadth of information that you can get off of data.census.gov. And then we'll start getting a little bit deeper through these other examples, showing you how you can compare data over time, how you can compare across geographies in a table, as well as a map view. So let's go ahead and get started with our demonstration. I'm going to pull up the geography profile for Leon County in Florida. And we do recommend using Google Chrome for data.census.gov. It's the preferred browser. Once you get to the landing page here, you'll notice there are two entry points to your search. You have the single search bar as well as the advanced search filtering experience. On the landing page, you'll notice there are two different options. There is that uh, single search bar as well as the advanced search. And we were just gonna find a profile for Leon County. So you just wanna type in the name of your geography to start. I'll type in Leon County FL and press enter. And then on the right hand side, you'll notice a blue box that says explore data. Click the blue box. And this will open up that profile for you. So you'll get a map of the geography, some high level statistics right there on the top. And as you scroll down more high level information, things like median age of the county compared to median age for the United States, and then more detailed breakouts on the right hand side in very nicely laid out line charts, bar charts and maps. You can Continue to scroll through and see all the different topics, things like foreign born, language spoken at home, race and ethnicity. And then if you see something on the left, I'm going to look at some poverty for this particular geography. You'll notice income and poverty. We can click on that and it will take us to that part of the scroll. So from here, what you can see is income and you'll scroll down and you'll get to poverty. You can see data for children under 18 living in poverty, as well as that mapped out across all the counties in Florida. And the nice thing about these geography profiles, it's a match of different data from across the Census Bureau. So you have American Community Survey, economic census data, but it also gives you the underlying table that this particular data point comes from. So we can see it's sourced from DP03, which is data profile three from the American Community Survey 2019 ACS five-year estimates. Once we click on DP03, it takes us to that table so we can see other data um, related to this particular topic. So we can see in this particular table, you have employment status, commuting to work, occupation, industry. And once we start scrolling down farther, we'll notice topics like health insurance coverage. And the last topic for this particular table is poverty. You can grab these columns from the header where it's shaded light blue and drag it right or left. We'll see percentage of families and people whose income in the past 12 months is below the poverty level. And then you can view the data. So the particular profile showed child poverty. You may be interested in poverty for the overall population. You'll see a line that says all people, and then you can scroll over and see for this particular county, it's 20.5% of the population in poverty. And of course, just to click away or scroll away, you have all of this other great information related to poverty right there on your screen. So if we're still good to move on to the next example, uh, comparing data over time, we'll show you how you can search by table ID, customize your view and save your results. Um, I'm gonna look at percent without health insurance, but look at this particular data variable over time in Harris County, Texas from comparison profile three, CP03 is the table ID for that. So you'll go to the data.census.gov tab and you just click in the upper left, the US Census Bureau, that will take you back to the main landing page where you can start a fresh search. It'll clear everything out. 
you'll type in CP for comparison profile in that single search bar and press enter. And then kind of the way you get this is just by using these table IDs and table titles over time. Once you've gone through the steps and you found something that contains the information you're looking for, it's the most direct way to access that data again for you in the future. If you don't know the table ID, that's fine too. We're gonna talk about that in just a moment. Um, but when you know it, you'll type it in and then you'll click on tables in the upper left. And from here, you'll get the different comparison profiles. So these mirror the data profiles. We had just looked at data profile three for selected economic characteristics. The reason I like these data profiles and comparison profiles is that they cover all topics of the American Community Survey in just four tables. So the ACS has over a thousand tables that are available and you might feel overwhelmed kind of sorting through all of that information. If you're looking for a starting point or the most popular statistics, these comparison and data profiles are a great place to look for you. The difference between the comparison profiles and the data profiles is the comparison profiles give you that information over time back to five years in one table view whereas the data profiles only provide this um, one year at a time. So we have the table that we're interested in. Now let's show how you can add in your geography using the filter. So last time we had typed Leon County in the single search bar. You can also use these filters to select your geography. So I'll click filter in the upper left. Then I'll choose geography county, Texas, and then I'm looking for Harris County, Texas. So you're always looking for a checkbox as a final selection for a filter. Once you've checked the box, you can scroll up and see your selected geography, Harris County, Texas, and then you'll click in the upper right chevron that says done. Now we wanted to look at health insurance data that were in CP03. So we'll click CP03 and then we'll click customize table in the upper right. This just gives us that table across our full screen so we can view things a little bit more easily. Just like before, you'll notice this particular profile. When I said it mirrors the data profile, it literally has the data, the same sections in the same order. So we know we had to scroll a little bit down to get health insurance. But before we do that, just pointing out, it gives you the 2019 estimate, 2018, all the way back to 2015. At the top of the table, when you're in the customized view, you'll get a lot of helpful buttons in order to add additional geographies, change your data vintage, you can also hide columns of the table that you're not interested in. So if I just wanted to look at some of this data in comparison for 2019 to 2015, you can click the hide button at the top of the table and then uncheck the boxes for the columns that you're not interested in. So I just wanna look at this comparison from 2019 all the way back to 2015. And I'm gonna talk about this statistical significance column here in just a moment. I'm gonna leave that checked for now and then click hide once again. So now we get an easy view to compare without having to do all that scrolling. We just need to scroll down in order to find the data that we're interested in for health insurance coverage. So we can see uh, right off the bat, no health insurance coverage that is then on the rise. You can see the estimate in 2019 is 22.4% compared to 2015 of 19.5%. There is a statistical significance asterisk indicated, which tells you that this difference is true difference. Um, when that statistical significance is not indicated, that means that the difference that you see between the estimates is likely to have occurred by chance simply because this is based off of a sample from the American Community Survey rather than 100% population. 
So this statistical significance is laying that out for you at the 90% confidence level. So not only can you kind of look at that for the overall population without health insurance, but you can also scroll through and see, for instance, if you wanted to look at this metric specifically for the employed population, you can see that is also on the rise too for folks that are employed. The population in that group without health insurance has increased from 2015 to 2019, and that difference is statistically significant. Once you've gotten this far, a couple things you may wanna do. One is to work with the data off of the site or save this for later. One thing, you can copy the URL in your address bar, open a new tab and paste that. This will take you back to the same table or if you shared it with a colleague, it'll take them back exactly where you were with your geography selections and your table shown. Any additional modifications may not be reflected in that, um, but it'll take you back to the core information that you want and need. Another option that you have is to export this particular table to Excel. So I'm gonna click on Excel right at the top of the table and choose export to Excel. And then click in the lower left to open up that exported file. Okay, so then we get the information here. And what you're gonna notice is that you have the information on the left-hand side is your table title with the US Census logo. It has the year 2019 from the comparison profiles. It tells you you chose Harris County, Texas, and it has that web address to take you back to the table. And then the second one contains the data from that table view. Anytime you want something that looks like the table, you wanna use the Excel export, not the download. The download will give you something if you want to work with the data. We're gonna take a look at that in one of the later examples. Beyond comparing over over time, you, all, you may also be interested in comparing across geographies. We're gonna show you how you can do that in a table view, specifically looking at data from the 2010 census. I'm gonna show the redistricting data from the Hispanic population in Wisconsin compared to the city of Milwaukee. So we'll click on the US census logo in the upper left. And for this example, we're going to use the advanced search because we know exactly what data set we want. That's something you can specify in the advanced search filter. So you'll wanna click on the surveys filter on the left-hand side. You've already had some familiarity with these filters. We just use one to select our geography. For surveys, you'll see options like ACS for American Community Survey, and DEC for decennial census. Now there are about 30 of these just for the decennial census to choose from. If you're looking for the first set of data that get released on data.census.gov from the decennial census, it's that DEC redistricting data, PL94171. We'll check the box for that and notice it's been added to the bottom of our screen as a selected filter. Another popular data set for the decennial census is summary file one. Next, we'll add in our geography, clicking geography. Then we'll choose state and Wisconsin. Check the box, make sure it's been added as a selected filter. And then for the city of Milwaukee, we refer to cities and towns as a place level geography. And then we'll follow the prompt selecting the state. What it's gonna do is load the first 100 cities to choose from so I can scroll and then get the next 100 on the list and keep going all the way till I get to Milwaukee. You probably want a quicker option and that is available to you in the upper right. Once you click on that spyglass and start typing in Milwaukee, 
it'll bypass and search just the one content of that individual panel, regardless if you've already loaded everything on screen, and then you can click Milwaukee City, Wisconsin. Now you have both of your geographies at the bottom of your screen, as well as the data set that you need. Once you're happy with your search criteria, click search in the lower right. And I always bypass this all results page. If I know I want tables, I click right on tables. And you can see the data are right here in just a few set of tables. So this is really one of the smaller data sets that are released. And we can see a couple of different options here. Looking right off the bat, Hispanic or Latino and not Hispanic or Latino by race. Table P2, that looks like a promising table title that will let us look at the Hispanic data across these two geographies. So you just kind of read the table titles on the left, click on something when you're ready to load it on screen, and then see if that particular table meets your needs. For Hispanic or Latino, you can see that's right in the second row of the table. The population in Wisconsin, 336,056 people based on the 2010 census. And Milwaukee, we can see, has almost one third of the Hispanic or Latino population in the state with an estimate of 103,007 people. Moving on to our last example for comparing across geographies in a map. The table is really nice if you have just a few geographies that you want to compare, but oftentimes you'll want to compare a lot of geographies at once. And maybe doing that in a table isn't going to be the best option when you can look at that visually. So let's look at this example. We're going to look at the percent of people age 65 and over across all states. And then we'll show how you can narrow that down to one of the smaller level geographies, the census tracts. We'll pull that up in Marion County, Indiana. So going back here, we'll go ahead and click the US Census logo in the upper left. And we're gonna use the advanced search. The first step to creating a map is to finding a table that has the particular data line that you're interested in mapping. So we'll follow a very similar to process to what we did before, where we use filters and we specify whatever's most important to us. Here I'm going to choose my geography to start. We wanted state and all states in the US. And then I may not necessarily know a particular table ID or even a particular data set that this particular data value comes from, and that's okay too. That's where you use the topics filters in the advanced search. And I'll click on populations and people, and then choose age and sex. Again, as you work through these panels, any words and phrases with checkbox is a final selection and words and phrases without checkbox. Once you click that, you get more detailed options to the right-hand side to choose from. We're good with our geography selection, all states, and age and sex. So we'll click search in the lower right. Then we'll choose tables in the upper left. Remember, the first step is to find a table that has the data value you're interested in mapping. You can see this first table title, age and sex, looks like it may. Right off the bat, we can see it gives pretty detailed age breakouts. But eventually, we can see there's a part of the table called selected age categories, and we can see a line on the table for 65 years and over. We can see for Alabama, that estimate in 2019 was 854,000 or 17.4% of their total population. Just to fully familiarize myself with the table, you maybe want to scroll to the right and see this particular table also breaks out those numbers for the males age 65 years and over with the corresponding percent male, as well as females, and a sixth column for percent.
And then finally, it goes to the next state and repeats the six set of data values across all of the states in the US. So once we know that we want to map out data from that table, you'll go ahead and click maps in the upper left. And by default, it's going to take you to the selection map. So you'll just need to click once again on the table title that has what it is that you're looking for. Here it is age and sex, S0101. Notice as soon as we made that click, it started to create a thematic map that's colored out in different shades of blue on our screen. By default, it's just taking that very first estimate in the table for total population, but we can change it very easily just by clicking the data variable drop down menu. And then what I like to do from here is to continuously scroll just to make sure everything's loaded in this particular set of options. You get six sets of labels. So a label for the total population, the percent, male corresponding to the third column for males, fourth set of labels for percent male corresponding to the fourth column in the table for percent male, and then all the way down to the sixth column. So we know what we needed was in the second column and it was labeled percent. So I'm gonna look at these set of labels that say percent. And from here, it's laid out in the same exact order that it was on the left-hand side of your screen in the table view. You'll scroll through and look for the selection of options that say selected age categories, and then start looking for the line item that says 65 years and over estimate. So percent, total population, selected age categories, 65 years and over estimate. As soon as you make that click, it's pulling that data and mapping it out in real time. And what we can see are the states with the darkest shade of blue have the highest percent of people age 65 years and over. We can zoom into the different states and even click on a particular state to get a little more detail. So we can see that 21.3% of people in Maine are age 65 years and over. Uh, Tyson, if I could uh, pause you for one second. Um, got a couple of questions that come, came in. I don't know if they're sensitive to what's being shown right now, but Tiffany, do you have a question? Yeah, thanks Tyson. So um, I'm working on a story on school districts and I wanted to see if the census has any data on that. Just to start like what, what the biggest school districts in the country are. Can you hear me? Yeah, sorry, I do hear you. Um, <laughs> I know Virginia was planning to triage the questions. Um, in terms of this one, okay. In terms of this one, I can say that we do have data on school districts. Um, there are three different types of school districts at the Census Bureau. So what you'll notice in the advanced search in the geography um, area is a list of different geographic levels and you'll scroll through them. And you'll notice here, they're actually closer to the top. There are elementary school districts and secondary school districts for some states and other states that have unified school districts. So you'll just click in the different states. And if you see options and check boxes on the right, that means that this state has geographies within this particular geographic level. And if you see something that doesn't have check boxes, that means that that particular geographic level of unified school district doesn't apply to this particular geography. And, and that data would be provided through the American Community Survey and the decennial census. All right, if, if we could just, I don't like, hate to de derail you, but I wanted to get a couple of these questions in and then we'll go back to the presentation. Um, I'll, I'll ask one here from Sam and then we'll go to Stella and then we'll go back to the presentation. So from Sam, he's asking, can you double query, uh, for example, um, percent selected age category plus race and ethnicity? Hi, Tyson. If I'm asking that in a novice way that doesn't make sense, I can also clarify. 
Um, <laughs> if you have any clarification that you want to put yeah. up, sure. I'm just kind of like, interpreting the question as you want to know if we have the data cross tabulated. Do we have information for 65 years and over of the white alone population or the Asian population as examples? Yeah, like, so if people 70 plus are eligible for vaccine in a lot of states, can I break that down by race, for example? Um, that is one of the great things of the American Community Survey. The fact that it has a lot of topics means that a lot of the data are cross-tabulated. Um, what you would be searching for is a set of pre-made tables where we've already tabulated that information cross-tabulated for you. It wouldn't be making anything on the fly, but you would just want to make sure in the topics in order to find those pre-tabulated tables that you would select age and sex as a topic, and then you would select race and ethnicity or Asian as an example. And, and then you would have to search through the list of tables to see, to see what's available. Um, so in general, yes, you can get age and um, and race together. Uh, you may need in some cases to add categories together or to calculate your own percentages. Um, but in general, yes, you can get the cross tabulated information. Okay. And Stella question. Hey, yeah. So, um, <laughs> I'm really not familiar with, um, using census data to cover redistricting. This is actually my first um, time. And so this might be a dumb question, but, um, first of all, I just want to ask if, um, DEC redistricting data is the same or like, how is that different from the 2010 census data? Like, isn't that supposed to be the same thing or like, is there a difference? Um, there, it, um, DEC, and Tyson, feel free to jump in, stands for decennial. Um, so it is the same thing. I think, um, Tyson, do you want to jump in if there's more clarification there? Sure. So my understanding of it is that the uh, redistricting data are released first. It's released for a particular purpose, and it's a much much more limited set of information. So just to show you that really quickly, uh, we had seen that there were like nine table results. I think if you add in the year 2010, you'll see that there are only actually five or six tables from the 2010 census that are released for the redistricting data. It covers very basic information. So um, things like age, race, uh, I'm just trying to get, sorry, to the decennial summary file one. The, the topics collected are based on the same census form, but with decennial census summary file one, you'll notice that you get 619 tables. So you're going to get a lot more detailed choices for these topics to click through and choose from compared to the redistricting data. And then uh, the other difference between the data sets are the geographies that are available. So um, I'm not sure offhand the exact differences, but what I can say is that summary file one, which I mentioned was one of the other popular decennial census data sets, that will give you the greatest number of geographies that you can actually view this information for. Uh, the way that you can find what's available for the geographies is by clicking at the top, show summary levels. Once you turn that toggle on, it knows that you've already made a selection for a particular data set, and then it shows you the geographic options that are compatible with this data set, which are clickable, and the ones that aren't compatible are grayed out. So what you'll find is less detail in redistricting, less number of tables, and fewer clickable geographies that this data are tabulated for. Um, but of course, that information gets gets more detail as, as those additional data sets are released from the same decennial census. Gotcha, thank you. One quick follow-up question. I noticed that there are several summary files. Um, I was wondering if there is like particularly any difference between each of them? Yeah, um, do you want me to take this, Virginia? Yeah, if you could. Sure, so what you'll notice primarily um, you just go through them really quickly on the surveys page. The ones that are primarily used, so for 2010 
census, we use summary file one and summary file two. Summary file two just allows you to access a set of information for particular detailed race groups that you may not be able to get through summary file one. So if you wanted to look at, as an example, the Japanese population or the Gila River Indians and people who identify with those particular race groups, we um, repeat those, those tables for those individual groups so you could look at a little bit of characteristics for those groups. That's what summary file two would give you rather than summary file one, which would be good if you wanted either very basic characteristics or characteristics of basic race groups. Um, summary files three and four, those are similar to what you would get now through the American Community Survey, but for the 2000 census. So when we did the long form census, we used summary file three and four to represent the, um, the long form sample. I would say those are the most popular ones. There are certain ones that cover specific geographies, as you can see some of the island areas that have their own data sets. And then uh, we do tabulate data for different congressional district boundaries as those vintages are updated. Sometimes we go back and update the decennial census tabulation to the new boundaries. So I think those are, are the most popular summary files and decennial data sets and some of the key differences between them. Thanks for elaborating. Okay, so let's um, just uh, FYI for the census folks, the, the questions you just heard were, uh, I forgot to ask or, or say where the folks were from, but Stella's from the, the, tennis, the, Nash, uh, the Tennessean in Nashville. Tiffany is from Bloomberg in California. Sam is from the AP in Nevada. And, and who else had the question? Uh, um, and uh, so, so right now, um, I see we have a couple hands up right now. I want to let Tyson get back to his, his demonstrations so he could finish that up, and then we'll have time for questions um, as soon as he's done. And we have we have Anna and Stephen Fowler who are um, in the queue right now. Excellent. So we had made the map here of 65 and over across states. And I just wanted to show mainly to show the power of some of these small geographies and how you can get the granular data. And even if you don't know what they mean, like census tracts, that's OK, too, because you can look at it on a map. Um, I was on the filter in the upper left. We had selected our geography in the second example using that button. You can also remove geographies. So I'm going to click the X next to all states in the US. And then I'm just going to show the census tracts in Marion County, Indiana. So we'll click on geography and it's already expanded this out a little bit. So what I want to do is scroll down and scroll back over to the left because I don't want to select a state this time. I want to select a census tract. So once I make that selection, it's going to populate with the list of states. So we'll choose Indiana and then it will start loading the census tracts. You'll have a button at the top that gives you all census tracts in the state, or if you wanted to narrow this down a little bit, which is what we want, Marion County, Indiana. And then from here, we'll have the option to choose all of the tracts in the county or individual census tracts one by one. We'll just choose all census tracts within Marion County, check the box, it's added as a selected filter, and then we click done in the upper right. As you're making those selections, the system is pulling the data in real time and loading it on screen for you. And what we can see is it still kept our data variable label 65 years and over, and we can scroll in. So this is Marion County in general, and the individual tracks are what you're seeing with the boundaries in between. The census tracts with the darkest shade of blue have the highest percent population 65 years and over. You can zoom in, of course, as we said before, with the state and click 
to see the individual values, 38.4% in this particular tract. And if you're not sure with what that tract means out here, you can zoom in farther and start to see street labels and really get a sense as to what these boundaries represent. The other way you may be interested in working with this data is to download the data. So in the left, once you click back to tables, and then on age and sex, and customized table, we had viewed this view before and exported to Excel. Anytime you want output that looks like what you saw on screen, you'll want to choose it Excel export. If you wanted to work with this data, you would choose download. So this is going to be if you wanted to sort the information, or perhaps you have your own GIS software and you want to create your own map outside of the website. Download is great file format for those options. We'll leave the 2019 checked and click the download button in the lower right. Let it load up to 100% and click download now. You'll click the lower left of your browser because we'll be using Google Chrome. And then it's going to open up a zip file for us. What we're going to see is the first entry. We'll have data with overlays in the naming convention. You want that file that has data with overlays. Um, and it'll have really three sets of files corresponding to each table that we've downloaded. We're going to give it just a moment here. Go through it one more time. For some reason, it looks like the zip file didn't open the first time. Um, but here's what I was mentioning where you're looking for data with overlays. Just double click that. And now we're going to see something that looks very different from what we saw on the site. You have your geographies not in the columns, but in the rows. And as you follow an individual row across sample census tract 3101.03, you'll see all of the estimates that were on the next table display of data.census.gov without any special formatting or indentation, but a great file format if you wanted to really work with this data. And we did want to leave some time for questions. I'm not going to cover on the site how to access the economic census data, but just wanted to point out that we do have this information and it's nice if you want to get data for particular industry codes. This just walks through an example using the advanced search filter. We use topics, geography and surveys. This one shows what you can get through codes where you can drill into a particular NAICS code. Here I drilled into 623 nursing and residential care facilities and mark the checkbox. We talked about in the Q&A how you can turn on the show summary level toggle. Geographies that are compatible with what you've already selected will be clickable and the other geographies will be grayed out. Here I've just selected the United States as a geography and then pulled up one of the tables. This particular table I've chosen from the economic census and you can see some information you could get for this particular code, number of establishments, sales, annual payroll, and number of employees, just as an example. And everything that we're doing for data.census.gov is driven by user feedback. If you have suggestions on how we can make this site work better for you, please email us at sedsci.feedback at census.gov. And then we also have a collection of educational resources. If you visit the link in the upper left, that's the same link on the landing page, you'll notice a little help button directly under the single search bar. This will take you to educational resources. So video tutorials, short videos, full length recorded webinars, release notes, and step-by-step -step PDFs with instructions. I know that Virginia, I believe you had one final slide to wrap up. Is, is that correct before we start? Uh, sure, just to um, point that out that you guys can 
continue to connect with us on um, all of our social media platforms, uh, along with just a friendly reminder to sign up for our email subscriptions. That's where you're going to um, receive all of the timely updates from us. And uh, also just a plug to sign up for the embargo access. Uh, we normally have about six embargoes a year on um, data, and it gives you guys about um, a one to two day time frame um, to access the data ahead of time. Um, the ACS is just a really great example of, you know, take there's so many topics um, and you can look at them from year to year ahead of time to go back and plan for your stories. Uh, and then when you do have access to the data, you can just really start digging in and writing them during that two day time frame. And uh, that's all I've got. So we're happy to answer a few questions if you guys have any. All right, for questions, we'll start with uh, Anna and then go to Stephen Fowler and then Ethan. Hi, um, one of the questions that, um, that I had was, during the pandemic, we've noticed that there's a lot of kids who don't have Wi-Fi or access to computers. Um, is there any survey, are there any surveys or information that would help know just how vast that issue is statewide and also in specific communities? Um, I mean, is there a question, for example, for either electronic computers or just Wi-Fi or both? Um, um, so the American Community Survey does have a question on computer and internet use. Uh, so that's annual. Um, the latest information is from 2019. Uh, and then I believe, um, and we can get back to you on the Household Pulse Survey and to see what um, information is is in that poll survey that might have some more information for you. Um, it's not gonna be as granular as the American Community Survey, but it can give you kind of a taste of, of um, maybe at a national level what's going on. But we'll get back to you on the household poll side. Thank you. All right, and Anna is from the Miami Herald. Um, uh, Stephen Fowler is from Georgia Public Broadcasting. Yeah, so uh, especially since the data is going to be coming a little later this year, one of the things that we want to do is create a master data set of a bunch of different uh, tables with the 2010 results with, I guess, the most recent uh, ACS from 2019 and then ultimately the 2020 decennial. Is there an easy way to do that um, with a bunch of different focuses? Like, you know, we want to look at things like uh, state house districts that had population decline or uh, job changes or things like that. So we can create one big data set that then we can break out stories uh, from. Yeah, um, and Tyson, feel free to jump in. Um, but two things I wanna point you to is the, um, we have an API that you can use and download um, that has the ACS and the most recent information in there from the ACS. We also have the 2010 census in there as well. Um, eventually the 2020 will be in there. Um, and then uh, just moments ago, actually we, fin um, we finished publishing all of the states for the geographic boundaries for the 2020 census. So um, those are like shape files. And um, so if you're doing any mapping uh, you can use and download those ahead of time and start um, importing um, some of the older data. And we also have crosswalks that uh, go, uh, that show you what, what boundaries have changed since, since 2010. So I would just point you to those two things. Tyson, is there anything you want to add? I think you covered it really well. I don't really have any additional guidance. We have a question in chat from Laura. Bischoff of, Bischoff of the Dayton Daily News. Piggybacking off Anna's question, any question in ACS or Pulse surveys that would illuminate how commuting times and or total miles driven has fallen off during COVID by geographic regions? I guess Virginia or Tyson is, yeah. uh, any thoughts on that? Yep, so eventually um, with the American Community Survey, again, the latest data is 2019, but we do have a commuting question in the ACS on travel time. And we also have a question on um, the mode of transport, whether it's you know taking a car or a bike or public transportation. Um, so I would check back in September for the 2020 um, ACS, and then we'll just have to get back to you on the Pulse survey. It's not something I'm um, very familiar with right now, but um, Tyson, is there anything I missed? No, I, I can't think of, of anything else. 
Okay, um, I have another question from Anna. Um, I don't know if you can maybe just explain that. Can you, can you link to the state's geographic boundaries data? What do, what do you mean by that? Oh, sorry. I thought there was recent data that was uploaded that we could download to create some maps. We're trying to maybe start doing that and that would be helpful to start mapping out whatever we're gonna have to do in a more elaborate way when everything else um, starts. We will send a crystal link um, to the shape files that were just released in the 2020. Um, these are um, the, the main purpose of these maps is the um, to help states prepare for their redistricting efforts. Um, so when you're writing your stories, it will also help you guys prepare ahead of time. Uh, so we'll send a link to Chris um, when this is done. Okay, and so the, the question from Ethan, um, uh, if we want to look at demographic changes as a result of COVID, what data set should we look at to get the most accurate picture? Is that going to be captured in the decennial survey or is that going to be something in the ACS surveys? So I would um, start, there's um, from a demographic standpoint, um, the 2020 census, the reference day that we use is April 1st, 2020. Um, so uh, you're not going to see uh, any changes that have occurred after that date in the decennial census. Um, the other points that you may wanna look at going forward is the American Community Survey next year. However, just noting that um, it's an annual survey, so it's kind of an, it's an average of that whole entire year. So um, the early months of 2020, um, you're not gonna see that full impact yet um, in potentially in the data because we don't have a full calendar year of, um, of the of uh, to, to look at yet from after the pandemic. Um, but the other one that you should look at is the population estimates. Um, you're going to get some demographic data, um, but more and more you're going to get um, just that hard population number. And um, that's as of July 1st um, of every single year. So uh, you're going to be able to get that for, um, that's already available for 2020 at the national level. Um, and going forward, you're going to be able to see that for 2021. Okay. All right. So um, we have time for one other, one or so other question. Anybody else have a question out there? Okay. Well, um, uh, Tyson and Virginia, I um, want to thank you very much for coming in and, and explaining all this to our fellows. My experience, oh, Jill has a question. I just wanted uh, to know how the American Community Survey is done compared to like the decennial survey and how, um, like how is the, the data, I mean, how can we gauge the accuracy of the data, I guess? Yeah, so um, the, the census is a full count. So we asked every single person in the United States um, how many people live there and also kind of, you know, those other gran granular demographic questions. Um, so that's the, the biggest difference is that this, uh, the American Community Survey is a sample survey. So we're only going out to three and a half million households every single year. Um, with the um, 2020 census results, I mentioned that blog series. Um, we're uh, you know, talking about quality in those for the 2020 census. So you'll, um, for the first time, when we release the apportionment results, we're also going to be releasing quality metrics around them. Uh, and then we're also going to, um, from the, the American Community Survey side, we uh, publish, and you may have seen in the tables that Tyson uh, was sharing, we publish a margin of error um, for each American Community sur Survey statistic um, that is on our website. So you can look at kind of the accuracy there uh, as well. Um, and Tyson, anything else to add? Anything? Um, no, I think that's really great. The only other quick thing is there is uh, a part of the ACS webpage that we also publish um, the sample size, response rate to the survey, and a few other metrics related to quality of the American Community Survey as well. That may be helpful for you in addition to the margin of error for a particular estimate that you're looking at. 